Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the final and second part of the Brave New Work webinar series. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in this event. Next slide, please. We have taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface of this webinar. You should see something similar on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. When you join today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing audio pane in your control panel. There will be time for Q&A at the end. You can either submit a question by typing it into the questions pane of the control panel, or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session and we will unmute you. Feel free to enter your questions at any time. We will collect them to address at the end. Lastly, if you experience any technical difficulties, please type it in the questions pane and someone will assist you. Next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Lori Diet, Chair of the ACR's Commission on Publications and Lifelong Learning, and Professor of Radiology and Radiological Sciences at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Dr. Diet, I turn it over to you to get us started. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. As Naz just said, my name is Lori Diet, and I am also co, besides what's on the slide, I'm co-chairing this program. The focus of tonight's program is on promoting well-being. And I have to say, months ago when we started to think about content for the program, we could never have anticipated the challenges that we were going to be facing and that we continue to face that makes the topic of well-being even more important. To give a webinar like this takes a team effort. And I want to give a great shout out to our Fabulous ACR staff, Najas and Anne-Marie and your teams. Thank you so much. We definitely couldn't have been doing this without you. Next, it is my honor to introduce my program co-chair, Dr. Frank Lexa, Chief Medical Officer of the Radiology Leadership Institute. Dr. Lexa. Thank you, Dr. Diet. And I just want to congratulate you on putting together such a great program. It's a fantastic collaboration between the RLI and your commission. I also want to thank the staff. Um, we put this together thinking we were going to be doing this live in Washington, D.C., and they just were able to turn on a dime and put this together so that you could all still have this. Um, tremendous lineup of faculty, and, um, and you know, she already said it better than I can. You couldn't come up with a better topic for today and probably for tomorrow and for the next few months and probably beyond. So this is just absolutely on point. I'm looking forward to a great program. And finally, thank you all for participating um, virtually and those of you who see it as a recorded program. So thank you all. Looking forward to a great evening. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lexa. Next, it's my honor to introduce tonight's program moderator, Dr. Raj Gupta. And can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> Division Chief of Abdominal Imaging at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Lori, so very much. Um, it is really an honor and a pleasure to be moderating this. And I want to thank the RLI and the ACR for being so thoughtful in putting this program on. Um, we have an outstanding program for you tonight. Uh, we have five outstanding speakers and a question and answer session that uh, we look forward to a very interactive format. So what I'd like to do is just take a moment and talk about some of the speakers that are gonna be coming up today and what they're gonna be speaking about. We have Dr. Claire Bender from the Mayo Clinic, and she's gonna be talking about some organizational and individual strategies to promote well-being. We have Dr. Nathaniel Margolis from the Ray W. Moody Breast Center in New York, and he's gonna be talking about cookies, or at least giving a radiologist a cookie and what happens if you do so. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Jenny Bencardino from the University of Pennsylvania, and she will be talking to us about the healing power of advocacy. Dr. Amy Patel from Liberty Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri, is going to be talking to us about maintaining morale 
during a healthcare crisis, an unbelievably apropos topic given what we're all going through today. And finally, Dr. Sanj Katyal from the Optimal Life Imaging Group in Pittsburgh will be talking about being burned out on burnout. So again, we have an outstanding lineup of speakers that will all be uh, talking to you now. At the conclusion of the session, we'll have an opportunity to do question and answer. I'll be collating those questions in the background, and then we'll have an opportunity to interface with all of our speakers. So without further ado, Dr. Bender, I turn the mic to you. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Next slide, please. Tonight, I'm going to talk about it's a shared responsibility, organizational and individual strategies to promote well-being. I want to thank the organizers of this program, uh, the RLI and the Commission on Lifelong Practice and Learning, and the staff for putting this together. Uh, I would say that uh, disclosures, um, I have none except uh, I have been burned out, and I will share that's the reason I have taken the interest in this topic, and it's been a lifelong interest of mine. Next, please. My presentation this evening is really about the levels of responsibility, leadership, and individualized. And I'm going to try to share or to promote why it is a handhold or it is a, a bi-directional responsibility. As Dr. Lexa mentioned earlier, and as did Dr. Diet, uh, the National Academy of Medicine uh, a couple of weeks ago talked about preventing a parallel pandemic. We know that burnout was uh, classified as a pandemic by the Public Health Service uh, at least a year ago. COVID-19 has hit, and within the last two weeks, uh, the anger, the anguish, the rage, and the systemic disparities have added to our well-being. And so what we need to do is be proactive, uh, certainly, uh, we have been trying to do retroactive things, and tonight I'm going to talk about some proactive things that organizations or groups or departments can do, and some key words for you to look at. Next slide, please. In my organization, uh, we have had uh, CEOs in the past who have had a variety of approaches, and tonight, this is about leadership. And Dr. Noseworthy, uh, along with Dr. Shanafelt, a name you might recognize who is now at Stanford, um, we're a team. And Dr. Noseworthy being the CEO, uh, through the various surveys done at our organization, noted that there was burnout in our troops. And Dr. Shanavelt was asked to help solve the issue. And if you, uh, at the end of the talk, I have a uh, reference list, and you will see that uh, Tate Shanafelt and his colleagues, both at Mayo previously and at Stanford, have been uh, recognized widely to the literature. In this particular article in 2017, the key drivers of burnout and engagement of physicians was described. You can read for yourself the driver dimensions, but let me just take a step back and when I talk about physicians uh, and since we are radiologists, radiation oncologists, medical physicists hopefully attending tonight, this also uh, this lecture or these concepts extend to our allied health folks and, uh, and, and that would include also our trainees and medical students. So the concepts are the same. I'm sure all of you have heard the three drivers or the results of burnout, your um, mental, your uh, not so much your physical exhaustion, your cynicism, you just treating a patient not as a patient anymore, and your inefficacy, you're just a feeling of helplessness. And what we're going to try to do tonight is to try to move the arrow to the right and talk about your engagement, your leader, leaders engagement 
and to develop vigor, dedication, and absorption. Next slide, please. In that particular article, Dr. Shanna Felton Noseworthy uh, described nine organizational strategies to reduce burnout and promote well being. Now, before we get into the list, and I'm going to th go through uh, nine of these, it is important that I talk about the myths. And uh, the uh, administrative teams will say, gee, you know, you want to do all of these, you're going to try all of these things, it's going to be costly, um, and how are we going to do it? My comment and others who I have worked with in the past have said, if you don't do it, uh, you, it is going to be more costly and you're going to lose staff or staffs and the cost of recruitment, retraining or new training and retention is more than implementation of such programs. Next slide, please. The first strategy is to acknowledge and assess the, the problem. And basically, as we heard last night, in the group, uh, it was about communication. And um, when Dr. Alexa talked about uh, the, the greatest time demands for any leader is the personnel or the human resource issues. And part of that is communication. So it's open dialogue, holding town halls. Now, uh, every, when I originally put the the uh, backbone of this talk together it was pre-covid it was pre um, minneapolis minnesota but now virtual everything think about doing things different so town halls small groups getting together but importantly and i should underline this listening to have leaders listen and that's what tate shanafelt did with dr noseworthy he sat him down literally and said look john uh, we have a problem here, and it's part of your problem, and you need to help us. Also, you should be able to measure the well-being of your staffs uh, using a variety of institutional performance metrics, uh, whether there's burnout, engagement, satisfaction, quality of life, fatigue, and stress. So getting some data to, to actually document that. And then going back, if, say if you're a department chair and you know that you have a problem, you need to be going to your institutional leadership and say, look, we have a problem here. It's likely affecting productivity. We need your help. And then to provide direction and resources as discussed. And to continue the cycle. It's not a one-time thing. And I think even more so now, it's going to be years until we figure what our new normal will be. Next, please. The second strategy is harness the power of leadership. And last night we heard some of the uh, important discussions uh, about selection uh, of effective leadership. The right leader, the development and preparation such as the RLI and being equipped for that role and regular assessment by individuals they lead. In other words, yes, we're looking at the leader themselves, but what do the troops really are saying and doing? And it's important for the leader to recognize the unique talents of individual uh, staff. And here we're talking about physicians. Everyone is different. Everyone brings a special talent to the table and they need to be recognized. No two people are the same. Next slide, please. Develop and implement targeted work units uh, for interventions. Kind of hard to do uh, in the new world that we live in, but it needs to be at a smaller level, not at a large level. What are the local challenges and solutions? They're probably unique to that particular group. To really get started, taking small steps is to identify the high opportunity work units. In other words, what little gains to get started can we make? 
And what this does is engages and empowers the team, including the leader of that particular group, to shape their own future. And that's really key, shape to feel that they have ownership in their own future. Next slide, please. Strategy four is cultivate a community at work. And my goodness, that's even more of a challenge in this world today. Peer support, my goodness, I think we've all lost a formal and informal peer support and we all need to be challenged to keep track of our colleagues and make sure that they're okay. Prior to COVID-19, uh, we had a physician lounge where refreshments and food and televisions and newspapers and meeting spaces were available and it really boosted our morale. That was shown by, by evidence by uh, repeat survey. In the Department of Medicine, which is about 600 physicians in my institution, they had a uh, compass program where the department actually paid for lunches um, uh, and a small group of 10 to 12 folks, um, lunches were paid off campus and they could discuss particular issues. There were three mandatory questions that they had to uh, discuss and report back but there was time for informal engagement and they were highly successful. I will share this was tried in our radiology department and it failed because uh, many of us did not have noon hours, identified noon hours. Next slide, please. Strategy five was rewards and incentives, uh, using them wisely. Um, uh, great discussions, controversies about the wrong or the right model of uh, compensation. And then we know that there are risks of each model. In my particular group, uh, we are, our institution, all of the physicians are salaried and the incentive is to take care of the patients. And we have a variety of resources, such as your own secretary, legal support, et cetera, that really um, are considered a benefit. So it has to be considered over the long term, what is good for the individual and what is good for the organization. We have had physicians leave because they decided it wasn't for them and that was probably a good choice for them as well. But the leaders needed, needed and it's, it's part of our culture as well. Culture and leadership is extremely important. Next slide, please. Align values and strength and culture. Probably the most important, one of the most important uh, uh, slides that I have here today is it requires a two-way dialogue. It can strengthen an organization and an individual if both the organization and the individuals are on the same page in synchrony, it can mean a greater outcome, a better outcome. And it also can identify areas for improvements. We have in our culture here, it really guides our organizational decision making that everyone has to embrace the culture and the values in which we live. If not, then this organization is not for you. And the leadership is very strong in stating that from the outset. Next slide, please. Strategy seven is promote flexibility and work-life integration. Uh, you know, how can you adjust your professional work effort? Does the leadership support part-time, um, uh, all certain levels of part-time, working at night, working at weekends, working at home? Flexibility as to when and how we work is critical. And then along with that, examining vacation benefits, life events, uh, 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 family leave, uh, uh, et cetera, are very, very important. And, strat and strategy for covering our nights and weekends can be left to the individual divisions. Next slide, please. Provide resources to promote resilience and uh, self-care, uh, taking care of yourself. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear many more examples later tonight about that, but the organization sees that this is part of their responsibility. We have a dedicated exercise fitness area now closed. We have uh, healthy food on site. Uh, 
personal financial health is important to the leadership of each and every one of the individuals. We have an Office of Staff Services, which helps us with financial planning. And our medical care, uh, we consider still a true benefit. Skills training, and I, you'll hear more about that later tonight as well. Next slide, please. Facilitate and fund organizational science. Uh, I will just say that uh, where we are today, thanks to the groups at Stanford and Mayo programs have done research and continue to develop metrics and, and uh, benchmarks for uh, well-being and to improve burnout, uh, I, I urge you to search uh, the respective literature. Next slide, please. Um, one thing I'd like to add uh, 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 is a different, newly described type of, type of leadership called grief leadership, leadership. This was a presentation by the National Academy of Medicine given a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the, the bottom line is the second bullet uh, for the leaders uh, to communicate effectively and openly. So the immediate response, the leaders in this very scary and nervous and anxious time are to be, be visible, accurate information, timely, use multiple ways to communicate, speak calmly and encourage working together as best you can, and to acknowledge grief. Um, I think everyone has uh, experienced some grief or know someone who has become ill. Next slide, please. That's the immediate response. Then there's the recovery phase to focus on the future, not going back. We're never gonna go back to the old normal. It'll be the new normal. And for goodness sake, make sure that you acknowledge those who want to help and those who do help and provide alternatives to blaming. There's been a lot of blaming that's gone around that people who have decided they couldn't work, they were immunocompromised, um, a better understanding and the leaders need to take the, the lead role and, and make sure that people um, understand uh, with respect that not everyone can work in these difficult times. And then the growing phase, uh, promote cohesion. Goodness, that's probably an impossible task in this, this, on, uh, this day, but engage your own support. Uh, you as uh, a, a member of the team uh, need to be very visible and show your support for for everyone. And I would just add the last is develop a behavioral response plan. Um, under or the Obama era, there was part of the pandemic planning, this was pre-COVID-19, that every group should have a behavioral response plan. I don't think Mayo does yet. I think we're taking care of the here and now, but I challenge everyone who's listening in to be thinking, you know, as if we get the surge, what's next? And what will be after that? And how are we going to take care of our people? And this came out of the Uniformed Services University and to give them credit for that. Next slide, please. Just uh, another uh, short, recent, article by Shanna Felt in JAMA just a couple of weeks ago. And I thought it was about listening and, and, and leaders, the need to be attentive. And this was uh, a, a survey that uh, Shanna Felt and his group at Stanford did to uh, survey healthcare providers uh, and their request to their organizations about what they wanted. And it was, there were five things, hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me, and care for me and the leaders in this difficult time need to make sure that they're doing all of these. Next slide, please. I will not spend time on the uh, individual strategies. You'll hear some more about this. Uh, I will just say that Harold's, J. Harold's back in 2016 outlined the remedies and look at yourselves, look at your own organizations. Where are you at? What have you done? Bottom line is we all need to find joy in our lives and we all need to value ourselves. And, and in other words, this means that your individual well-being coupled with a growth um, mindset uh, that sees you that it's okay, um, be satisfied with who you are and, and we're all gonna make errors and have imperfections 
but value yourself. We need, as professionals, learn to value who and what we are. Next slide. This is the list that Harold's has. I won't go through those as uh, we'll hear more about that probably in, in detail uh, throughout the rest of the night. Next slide. And integration. Um, I failed at work-life integration. Uh, it took me until my last third of my, my career to uh, integrate my life, but uh, I decided to uh, use time management strategies. I use a calendar for both. I have a definite firewall between my professional and personal lives. I think both Lori and, and Frank and, and uh, Anne Marie and Nazish would, would agree with that. Um, my dream in life would be to have an adult nanny to help me with, with all the things that go on. Nannies are wonderful, but I think that might be a new business for someone to develop. And to recognize that the concept of being good enough, uh, uh, don't beat yourself up because you're, you're not perfect, and to learn to accept that. Next slide. Just a note about the well-being index that the, uh, uh, is free to the American College of Radiology uh, members. Uh, many residents use this. It's an anonymous nine-question tool. This was selected by the ACR, and you can monthly uh, measure yourself on how you're doing with uh, your well-being. And uh, I urge you to seek this out and see how you're doing. Uh, it's full of resources, and the well-being program uh, that the ACR has developed, uh, uh, this is the well-being index is part of that. Next slide, please. So radiologist. Radiation oncologist, medical physicist, allied health, well-being begins with leadership. The individual remedies are definitely person-specific. Establish joy in your professional and personal life and value yourself. I thank you very much. And the last slide will be the references which will be available for you that I have referred to tonight. Thank you. Now on to Dr. Magos. I appreciate your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bender. I'm uh, Nate Margolis, and I am a breast radiologist. I work at Orange Regional Medical Center, which is about an hour north of New York City. I'm the medical director there, and I'm in a private practice of about 30 radiologists, um, and we. Uh, staff number of uh, outpatient facilities and hospitals in the northern New York suburbs. Uh, so you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So the title of my talk is If You Give a Radiologist a Cookie. And you can go on to the next slide, please. I have no disclosures, although I do love cookies. Next slide. So if you give a radiologist a cookie. Now, this is a children's story written in 1985. Um, I think it does capture the millennial spirit, the spirit of those who were born in the 1980s. So I'm going to uh, deconstruct the themes in this book and relate them to radiology and the brave new work. So I do believe that cookies are a cure for burnout. And when I say cookies, I mean that we, um, we have these intangible rewards in our career as radiologists, and we, um, we should be focusing on those rewards. Uh, uh, to help us get through any uh, any kind of burnout we might experience. So I do think it's uh, the responsibility of leaders to help give cookies to radiologists, but it's also something that we can find from within us. We can find those intrinsic rewards within us. So I'll be discussing these individual strategies to combat burnout. And uh, we'll go ahead and actually start reading the book. Next slide, please. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask you for a glass of milk. When you give him the milk, he'll probably ask you for a straw. When he's finished, he'll ask you for a napkin. Next slide. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm thinking to myself as I'm reading this to my two-year-old daughter, is this the millennial mindset? The mouse is asking for cookies, he's asking for milk, and now he's asking for a napkin. Is he entitled? Is he never satisfied? Is he selfish? Is he egotistical? 
So these, I think, are some uh, common stereotypes of, uh, of some that are in the millennial generation at work. But we'll go through these, uh, these themes and see if that's really the truth. Next slide. Then he'll want to look in the mirror to make sure he doesn't have a milk mustache. When he looks in the mirror, he might notice his hair needs a trim. So he'll probably ask for a pair of nail scissors. Next slide. So looking in the mirror, is this an example of someone who's obsessed with their self-image? I mean, we do love taking selfies, but I think that in the millennial generation, especially, people want to improve their self-image. In the work sense, that means improving quality because image is everything. The perception of our quality is actually a motivating factor. Millennials also want to belong, they want to fit in, they want to connect with causes. So uh, as you can see, there's a number of causes, uh, you know, there's rallies and protests happening, but I think in general in our society, I think pe people are clinging to causes and, and wanting to belong to a certain belief system. Millennials, I think also want recognition. It, some people call it generation me, and I don't believe this is in a selfish sense. I think this is that uh, millennials want to be recognized for hard work and good quality work. Next slide. So what do millennials want at work? I, and, you know, I consider myself to be an old millennial, so I can uh, speak to this. But I think, you know, the new workforce, the radiologists that are coming out of training and being hired right now and the ones that are in their first um, five, five or six years in practice are in the, this millennial generation. So what is it that will satisfy millennials? What kind of cookies are we looking for? So uh, there was a survey of 8,000 millennial employees and only 44% are having a positive experience at work. And that's the lowest of any generation. 75% of those, so the vast majority, thought that businesses are too focused on their own agendas rather than striving to make an impact on society. 50% were influenced to accept a job based on a company's involvement with a cause. So as millennials, we're looking for a group or a practice that is aligned with a certain cause that we believe in. However, only 28% reported feeling that their current place of work was fully utilizing their skills. And about 53% aspire to be a leader or an executive within their current place of work. So this survey was done among all industries, um, actually not in medicine, but I think that there's a common myth that millennials like to job, jump around from job to job with no real investment in their employer. But I think on the contrary, they actually want to do something big and be part of something, not just take selfies and care about themselves, but also be part of a cause that they believe in. Next slide. So I think an example that hammers this home is when radiologists try to improve their practice and improve the quality of care that's happening in their community. Uh, so this was one um, imaging 3.0 case study that I think illustrates this point. Um, in this case study, they were using R-Scan which is a program to reduce inappropriate follow-up imaging. So they gave an intervention, an educational uh, course uh, to referring physicians about ovarian masses. They measured um, pre and post ordering patterns. The number of inappropriate imaging recommendations decreased by 55% and the appropriate follow-up imaging recommendations climbed from 69 to 85%. So I think in this sense, radiologists are looking in the mirror to solve inappropriate imaging issues and become part of the solution. So I think looking in the mirror really means looking inside ourselves and inside our practice to see how we can improve and therefore become more satisfied with our work. Next slide. Back to the story. When he's finished giving himself a trim, he'll want a broom to sweep it up. He'll start sweeping. He might get carried away and sweep every room in the house. He may even end up washing the floors as well. Next slide. So sweeping every room in the house and then going on to mopping it. I think this really speaks to work ethic, but why would working harder equate with wellness? Or doesn't working harder mean that you're going to be burned out? On the contrary, I think that by working hard and producing a better product, collaborating with radiologists, collaborating with non-radiologists, we can actually achieve a better quality of work. 
also volunteers and has the ability to um, bring bring happiness to radiologists and the community at large. Next slide. So some examples of collaboration with radiologists. So this goes beyond image interpretation. Um, we've actually started in our practice um, uh, a noon round table where we discuss a certain topic. Uh, so we've been discussing things like COVID-19 imaging findings, uh, management of incidental findings. One, one radiologist our group will actually give a, a talk and using Google Meets, we can all see each other and uh, discuss things that we wouldn't normally have time to discuss because we're all in different locations. I'm also a fan of uh, a walk and talk where um, you can go out for a walk, leave the, the reading room, go to the physician's lounge, maybe get a cookie while you're out there. But I think taking a walk and talk is, is a great way to collaborate with your radiologist colleagues and a great way to have that feeling of wellness at work. So collaboration with non-radiologists, this also pertains to activities we can do outside of the reading room. A lot of individuals go to tumor board and rounds, but I think there's been a lot of effort on the uh, COVID-19 front. Um, and in this crisis, there's actually been more and more opportunity to collaborate with our colleagues outside of radiology. Uh, and I'll speak to that. Volunteerism has, has also, um, been more more available in terms of going overseas to uh, other countries to teach imaging, uh, which is, has been happening more and more. So go on to the next slide, please. So I wanted to speak to uh, imaging 3.0 um, case studies that are pertaining to uh, COVID-19. So there have been a few uh, case studies coming out where radiologists are reaching out across uh, to other departments and helping with COVID-19. So in uh, New York uh, Presbyterian in particular, they uh, volunteered to help triage their colleagues with COVID-19 symptoms. So the radiologists were guiding anyone who has symptoms at the institution to the best course of action, whether it's to stay home or go to the emergency room for further treatment. So these are things that the radiologists were doing in addition to their daily workload uh, after imaging interpretation, they were going on to a portal to help uh, with uh, COVID-19 um, symptomatic patient, uh, symptomatic colleagues. So the author of this case study said that we're all physicians at first and radiologists second. We will get through this by banding together as a healthcare community and working as a team. That's what we do. Next slide, please. So back to the story, when he's done, he'll probably want to take a nap. You'll have to fix up a little box for him and he'll crawl in with a, with a blanket and pillow. He'll crawl in, make himself comfortable and fluff the pillow a few times. He'll probably ask you to read him a story. Next slide. So after working so hard, he needs to take a nap. And I think that's true of all of us. And a lot has been said about, um, you know, getting enough sleep, exercise, eating right. But I think one thing that's, that's very doable is mantra, meditation, and that's something I'll speak about. Um, of course, having time off is nice for being able to pursue interests outside of work, uh, but caregiving. I think that uh, millennials especially um, have, uh, have been seeking more maternity and paternity leave than prior generations. Uh, and then also eliminating burdens is extremely important for wellness. So um, managing workload, distractions, and this could be done in the form of hiring additional radiologists and reading room assistants. Next slide. So mantra meditation is the act of repeating a word or phrase silently or aloud. This is a portable way to meditate and relax. It's been shown to increase mindfulness and decrease burnout in healthcare workers. So some of the mantras that I use are slow down and when I feel like it's overwhelming, the work will get done by the end of the day. Next slide. Another example of eliminating burdens is actually having reading room coordinators. So this was a case, um, this was a study done at NYU where um, they were using reading room coordinators mostly to uh, get the referring doctor on the phone, which is an onerous task as all of us know. But um, in doing so, 90% could interpret a new exam rather than waiting to communicate the results compared to 
and 87.5% of radiologists said they could read more studies after the communication tool is put into place. So this reading room coordinator, sort of like the adult nanny, uh, would take care of mundane tasks while ra so that radiologists can focus on image interpretation. So this in turn would improve job satisfaction and decrease burnout. Next slide. So you'll read to him from one of your books and he'll ask to see the pictures. When he looks at the pictures, he'll get so excited he'll want to draw one of his own. He'll ask for paper and crayons. He'll draw a picture. Next slide. So the mouse here is getting so excited about looking at the pictures, he'll want to draw one of his own. So this really rings true because I think that we're all motivated by the enjoyment of work. We're mo motivated by the intrinsic rewards of being a physician. And I think when people have choices and control over their work environment, it, it is more rewarding. So when radiologists have input into protocols and are able to work in their subspecialty, I think there is more enjoyment. So I think that leadership should foster these factors. There's also something called gamification, where instead of having monetary rewards, you can have uh, rewards or prizes for things like getting the lowest possible dose in fluoro cases, uh, finding the most cancers, and uh, something that's very entertaining at the workstation, you could guess nodule sizes and sizes of uh, cysts and stones and then measure them to see if you're right. Next slide. When the picture is finished, he'll want to sign his name with a pen. Then he'll want to hang his picture on your refrigerator, which means he'll need scotch tape. He'll hang his drawing up and stand back to look at it. Next slide. Hanging up the drawing and standing back to look at it is something that we all need to do. We need to recognize that we, we've done a good job. A job well done could be getting the right diagnosis, early detection of a breast cancer or a lung cancer on screening. We need gratification at work. We need rewarding interactions with patients, a pat on the back from radiologists, referrers, or, or even technologists, and the chance for career advancement. We need the opportunity to improve quality and add value, whether it be through crafting actionable reports or, or using standardized recommendations across the practice. And in doing so, we can increase patient satisfaction. Next slide. So one other uh, imaging 3.0 case study that I wanted to share was uh, behind the curtain when pediatric radiologists give results to the patients directly. So they said that spending time with patients minimizes physician burnout. So you might think that you know, having a full caseload and also talking to the patient would increase burnout because there are just too many things to do. But on the contrary, on the contrary it decreases burnout because it personalizes what radiologists do and allows them to connect more directly with patients. So some families want the results from the pediatrician, some families want to know whether something is wrong immediately from the radiologist. But as radiologists, it's our job to meet the patient's needs, not just our own needs or the referring physician's needs. So uh, the author said that knowing that we were able to provide this service efficiently and help put a face on the radiology department is incredibly satisfying. It really has a positive impact on our day and we feel like we're doing something special for patients and families. Next slide. Looking at the refrigerator will remind him that he's thirsty. So he'll ask for a glass of milk. And chances are, if he asks you for a glass of milk, he's going to ask for a cookie to go with it. Next slide. Another cookie. Is this millennial radiologist entitled, never satisfied, selfish, and egotistical? I would argue not, because cookies are the cure for burnout. Radiologists are entitled for these cookies. We're entitled to pursue happiness at work. And in doing so, we're not being selfish and egotistical. We're actually working toward the common good. Next slide. So the cookies that I'm talking about here in this presentation are ways that we can achieve happiness. And if we achieve happiness at work, we can achieve wellness. So radiologist wellness can be achieved by focusing on rewarding activities and avoiding burdens and tasks. Increased work satisfaction will in turn increase quality. Working for the greater good is something not only for millennials, but for all of us. 
but it is important to recognize that millennials are looking for a practice pattern that aligns more with their interests and their values. And if we recognize that, we can help increase satisfaction at work for the next generation of radiologists. Next slide. So why give a radiologist a cookie? If you give a radiologist a cookie, he will feel more satisfied at work. He or she will provide more value to patients, referrers, colleagues in the health system. Then chances are the quality of care will improve. If you increase quality, you improve patient care. If you improve patient care, you improve the radiology image. If you improve the radiology image, then radiologists will be rewarded with cookies for years to come. Next slide. Thank you so much for your attention and stay tuned for if you give a pathologist a pancake. Next slide. You can find uh, my references here. Good evening. Next slide. Hello, I'm Jenny Bencardino, Chief of Musculoskeletal Radiology at Penn Medicine in Philadelphia. My topic tonight is the healing power of advocacy. Next slide. I have no disclosures. Maybe I have one. Hair salons are still closed in Philadelphia. Next slide. I actually want to start by appreciating all of you. We are in the middle of the pandemic, a national crisis. And I don't have to be in the same room as you to know that we have all been deeply affected. And yet you are here showing up to further develop your organizational and individual strategies to promote well-being. I appreciate that. As the title suggests, I'm a big fan of an advocacy-centered approach to life. And so I'm facing the challenge of having a virtual conversation with you aimed to inspire you to start using advocacy as a very effective tool that brings good to other people's lives and brings good in our own lives. Next slide. The word advocacy takes its root from the Latin advocare, meaning to speak for someone. It implies identifying a cause, believing in it, mobilizing and influencing others to support it and reach the desired change. Next slide. Being an advocate starts by identifying a cause, a source of inspiration. What inspires you? A motivational speaker, a community leader, a public figure, an activist, a friend, a colleague, a book, a movie. For instance, my involvement with social advocacy was inspired by Alice Goffman's TED Talk, how we are priming some kids for college and others for prison. Next slide. To be an advocate, we need to identify what motivates us to get the job done. What motivates me is the idea that all human beings deserve equal rights and opportunities. For minority children in the United States to succeed in life, education is the main, if not the only path. Sending underprivileged Black and Latino children to prison instead of college is not, extremely is not only extremely costly for taxpayers, but also unjust. Just to put things in, into perspective, nine out, of, uh, nine out of 10 minors housed in juvenile detention centers are minority children. It costs taxpayers close to $9,000 a year to keep a child in prison, five to 10 times more than investing in their education and programs that support these underprivileged minors. Next slide. To be an advocate, we need to identify 
What, why does advocacy matter? Advocates them their actions to change policy, practice, and legislation that affect the specific group of people at the core of their inspiration. Inside radiology, the American College of Radiology Advocacy Network is committed to invest efforts for the betterment of our profession. Many of you already invested in community work outside radiology. Know, know firsthand that we give our best to the causes that touch us personally. Next slide. How do we get things done? We must first research in depth the subject attend meetings, listen to experts, gather data, and do our own field work. For instance, sociologist Alice Kaufman spent six years living in a troubled Philadelphia neighborhood, seeing firsthand how children and teens of African, American, and Latino backgrounds are funneled down the path to prison before she actually got down to write her thesis. It took her six years of field work. Next slide. Advocates know that finding support is crucial to get things done. Where do advocates find support? They join forces with advocacy groups in the area of interest. They effectively use PR and make their cause go public. They also talk and influence legislators. Next slide. Being involved in advocacy and community service can have healing effects in the setting of professional burnout and dissatisfaction. By putting ourselves in someone else's shoes, we can experience life from a different perspective. It helps us bring hope to others by showing them that they matter. The sense of fulfillment and empowerment found in advocating for others can catapult us into a better and healthier self. Next slide. So be brave, be an advocate. I want to finish with this quote. Dominate our culture has tried to keep us all afraid to make us choose safety instead of risk, sameness instead of diversity. Moving through that fear, finding out what connects us, reveling in our differences, this is the process that brings us closer, that give us a world of shared values of meaningful community. And this is the hooks. Last slide. So COVID-19 now opens the door for us to think about ways that we can advocate for our patients, our colleagues, and all of those impacted by uh, disparities, healthcare disparities. Thank you so much for your attention, and I look forward to join the panel. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Amy Patel. I'm a breast radiologist in the Kansas City area. Uh, I'm a, a medical director of Liberty House for Women's Imaging. Um, I'm actually a part of a private practice group uh, where we are physically uh, contracted with Liberty Hospital. We've been there for almost 30 years and I'm an assistant professor of radiology at the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine. Next slide please. Today I'm going to talk about maintaining your team's morale during a healthcare crisis and I'm going to show today some examples of what we've done collaboratively collaboratively um, with the hospital uh, to really promote um, uh, the morale of our um, hospital, of all the healthcare workers working together uh, towards one goal. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures. Next slide. So prior to COVID-19, uh, we were really, really flourishing. You can advance the pictures, please. Uh, we were having just a really good, uh, you know, 
as far as uh, our hospital goes, we were very happy all working together. Um, you know, what's really great about uh, Liberty Hospital and where we work is that uh, we have a lot, we have really great retention. We really don't see a lot of turnover uh, because the hospital in and of itself are, does things all year round to really promote uh, well-being uh, and to mitigate burnout. Um, our CMO is very big on doing things, implementing activities throughout the hospital to mitigate burnout. And I think as a result of just going that extra mile, uh, we are seeing, you know, we, we've seen people that just don't leave and don't, uh, don't quit and go to other places. So it is, it's just a really great environment um, for everyone in the healthcare team, the physicians, ancillary staff, everyone. Next slide, please. You can advance. So some of the things that we were doing prior to COVID-19 uh, was something called Shining Star or Ray of Light. And it is a caregiver or provider recognition. Uh, advance. So essentially, employees who've been nominated um, by patients, uh, patients, family members, other employees get this uh, recognition. Advance. And advance. So this is sort of an example here of those who are nominated as shining stars and a ray of light. So a lot of times um, different, uh, you know, members of the healthcare team are nominated and then they're recognized. And although, you know, this may seem just like a very small recognition, it means the world to uh, everyone on the healthcare team that is recognized in this way. I mean, I remember when I um, was um, nominated or recognized as a shining star, uh, they came over, they gave a special lapel pin to me. And it's just something, it's small, but it goes quite a long distance um, in terms of just making you feel recognized for the hard work that you put in. And so as a result, um, you know, this has been very, very well received. And this is something, like I said, that was, has been very um, well received uh, since COVID-19. And of course, uh, since we've been going through this uh, has just been really phenomenal. We really um, increased the recognition, which has helped tremendously. Next slide. And advance, please. So also prior to COVID-19, we had what's called the Hughes Family Employee Assistance. And essentially, um, this has been really phenomenal. And now, as you can imagine, it's utilized more than ever. And this is you know, financial support for our employees and fa uh, facing a crisis. So prior to COVID-19, uh, employees could utilize this if by chance um, they came uh, upon a hardship, like let's say a spouse was laid off or perhaps someone was going through cancer treatment and was having a, a hard time um, making ends meet. So through this employee assistance fund, it pays for anything from a medical bill to just a bill to uh, pay for your electricity or even a mortgage payment. Uh, so this is a very, very um, well-received uh, thing that we do in the hospital. Um, and as a result, as you can imagine, and I previously uh, noted, it's just being utilized at such an unprecedented rate uh, to help those whose hours have been cut uh, due to coronavirus uh, and has just been um, tremendously appreciated by those who need to utilize this assistance. Next slide. And then also prior to COVID-19, uh, we have what's called the Grateful Patient Program. So this is a program where if a patient has um, really received great care at the hospital, uh, they can make any, uh, any amount of donations that they want. So oftentimes with our breast center, uh, a patient will receive this really beautiful card uh, that talks about the Grateful Patient uh, Program and if they'd like to contribute uh, towards our, for example, our women's health Health fund, which is a fund I'll talk about in subsequent slides, uh, they can do so. So, um, and and this is something that um, is it's just a feel good thing, not just from um, an organizational hospital standpoint, but just a community standpoint, bringing us together, um, helping those in need. And it also, when patients do contribute, we we feel very acknowledged, like we've done such a great job. And everyone who's involved with that, uh, with the care of the patient, just takes a lot of pride in that. Next slide. 
And then also a uh, prior to COVID-19, oh, can you, yeah, thank you. <laughs> prior to COVID-19, we had also a uh, patient assistance, which is still going on. And as you can uh, imagine, it's uh, something that's being utilized uh, more right now as people have been uh, laid off, furloughed, that sort of thing. And it provides patients um, needed financial support if they um, aren't able to pay for a medical bill. Um, and, you know, the, the thought of it is that we hope to stem the number of readmissions by kind of extending that that olive branch. And we also have assistance, particularly for students who maybe don't have any health insurance or are just really struggling, but they need to have care and they need to um, essentially uh, get that taken care of, but we don't want to necessarily get them readmitted to the ER all the time or that sort of thing. So we really try to help them uh, if they do meet the qualifications for patient assistance. And then we have um, what's really near and dear to my heart is our uh, Women's Health Fund. And this is a fund that we have uh, where I talked about for Grateful Patient, if we have uh, patients who contribute towards uh, the Grateful Patient Program, sometimes this money will uh, be transferred, particularly for those who receive care by our radiologists, the breast center, our technologists, and it goes towards the Women's Health Fund. And this is for patients who essentially, you know, can't afford a screening mammogram, patients who um, need a biopsy, um, you know, any sort of diagnostic uh, treatment from the imaging side. So uh, it's been really incredible. The Women's Health Fund has also paid for other things in the breast center that we needed to serve our patients. So, uh, and that just feels good. Whenever we do have con contributions towards the Women's Health Fund, uh, it makes us feel just wonderful that people are acknowledging our work. And then when we're able to help community members in their time of need, it really helps us. And I think in a lot of ways it does help to mitigate burnout and to help boost morale and to maintain and sustain morale efforts. Next slide. Also prior to COVID-19, uh, what has been incredibly well received is something called the lavender cart. Uh, and all of you may have some form of lavender cart at your institutions, but our lavender cart is basically a purple cart that's stocked full of stress relieving therapies. Um, and there's also snacks, um, you know, there's supposed to be healthy snacks, but of course, you know, there's sometimes some chocolates and things like that, which we find very stress relieving. Um, and basically they, and they have stress balls and all sorts of really fun things. And so they cart around, uh, they bring around this cart, obviously, you know, prior to COVID-19, um, here's a picture in our breast center, two of our techs are really happy. Obviously we're not wearing masks, it was prior to the pandemic. So, but it shows how happy everyone is. And so when the lavender cart comes by, it's just really fun. And it's just one little thing to really boost morale. You know, not that expensive, you know, having all of these things on the cart, but just the, you know, just those little acts of kindness that is shown by uh, the hospital staff towards healthcare workers really helps boost morale during that day. Next slide. And then COVID hit. Next slide. So as you can imagine, you know, it's been really difficult for us, um, just like all of you have been experiencing. So uh, you know, what's been really incredible about our hospital is our physicians have worked really hard with our staff, with our administrative leadership, with our hospital foundation uh, to not only sustain our efforts of our morale, but, you know, really um, try to up, you know, up our game because, you know, at this time, just doing what we've been doing is not enough. We need to do more to improve morale and to maintain morale. So one of the things that we've been doing at our hospital are, uh, is something called words of encouragement. And the hospital essentially um, encourages community members, can be healthcare workers, anyone to submit words of encouragement. So we've been getting so many notes from um, healthcare workers, from patients of all ages, from the community. Uh, and we have uh, deemed it a campaign, a hashtag heroes work here campaign, uh, where these words of encouragement, once they're submitted, they're shared uh, with the staff and they're shared quite frequently. And especially Especially they were shared uh, quite frequently during the pandemic through in the very crux of the pandemic we were receiving words of encouragement at least weekly to really you know help motivate us and boost us and in we get we got them in forms of an email where all the words of encouragement that had been submitted 
uh, were all sort of wrapped up um, in a newsletter. We received it, and it just was that extra little pick me up that we needed um, every week to keep us going, especially our frontline workers, the ones in the ER, the ones that were really uh, challenging, having challenging days. Next slide. And then as you can imagine, like everyone has been doing and just such a phenomenal job working together, we had a really formidable supply drive where we had supplies just coming in from everywhere and they're still coming in so we're very appreciative from from universities um, our local kansas city southwest airlines got to work to make masks for us i mean it has just been such an overwhelming response and and i think that seeing that so many organizations uh, and businesses who want to help and want to keep us safe and to protect us has meant a lot and i think has really helped uh, boost morale as well next slide What we've also implemented since the pandemic is a meal delivery train. So essentially packaged meals are delivered on Tuesdays and Thursdays, particularly to, uh, let's say, a healthcare worker that's been, uh, their hours have been cut or have been furloughed um, so that they have a meal. Also our elderly who aren't able to get out right now, um, patients uh, at nursing homes that might not be able to get out. So we try to do this meal train right now to help those who need a hot meal. And it's been really, really successful. And all of this has been executed by our foundation. And so I have to tip my hat off to them because this has been such a well-received um, you know, initiative we've implemented. They've worked tirelessly to feed so many people. Uh, to date, through all of our um, activities that we've been doing during that that very, um, you know, the stretch of the pandemic where we had the stay-at-home orders and all that, we've reached almost 8,000 patients. So really incredible work. Next slide. And then, like I previously touched upon, we have um, what's called a weekly good news uh, newsletter that not only do they uh, include the, the good news of you know, patients that uh, have really wonderful things to say, uh, want to say thank you, uh, but we also give updates. Like, for example, on this slide, it shows employee assistance expanded, um, you know, supplies and smiles. Just, uh, you know, we just like to you know, shine a light on some good news. And so that good news as well has really helped um, with morale, just to show that all hands on deck, we're all working together uh, to fight this um, as a united front. Next slide. So my closing thoughts um, in regards to all the activities that we've we had been doing prior to COVID-19 um, and, and then uh, now uh, is, you know, you really have to be thoughtful about these activities. If you don't put thought into these activities to maintain and boost morale, healthcare workers pick up on that. The staff picks up on that, that, oh, I mean, they put no thought into this and they're trying to make us happy. You really have to think about it very thoughtfully because if you do that, they will pick up on that and they will know that they feel valued and they're very respected a person or of the healthcare team. You have to be innovative. So, you know, I think that the things like the lavender cart where you have all these stress-free things, I think it's such a fantastic thing that we provide for our healthcare workers. Such a little thing that goes such a long way. So when you're innovative um, with your efforts, uh, I think it really makes all the difference. And then you just really like I'm kind of alluding to, you just have to put forth effort. If you put forth the effort, your healthcare team is going to pick up on that, your physicians, your other healthcare staff. Uh, and, you know, morale will be maintained and if not take, be taken to another level that in which you've never seen. I'm really um, amazed by uh, how we've really banded together at this time, um, especially with my group. There's really been no infighting. We've, you know, we're facing challenges like other practices and institutions, but we're really just trying to um, keep our eye on the main goal and working together uh, to keep patients safe, keep everyone safe, and just to get through it. Um, and, and that kind of leads into keep it positive. We really do try to keep it as positive as possible. Um, maybe that's just the Midwesterners in us, uh, the Midwest friendly, but we really try to keep it positive. And I think um, even if it's a difficult, difficult time, we try. And I think that that has really helped us with maintaining, if not boosting morale during this very challenging time. You really have to know what makes your team tick. 
uh, particularly with my team in the breast center, um, our, our radiology department, um, you know, the way to their heart is through their stomach. So uh, our group has been feeding them some meals here and there, which has been very well received, um, you know, uh, having some just some really good catered meals, packaged, you know, meals uh, has really, <laughs> that really makes them tick and it makes them work really hard. And, and we want to acknowledge how hard they're working and how we value them and how we're all one team. And there's no, you know, hierarchy here. We're all working together. And, you know, we, and just like this next bullet point says, we just want to acknowledge their hard work and we want to acknowledge their value. So not just our technologists, but everyone in the healthcare team um, at our hospital, we really do value them. And again, I think that that's uh, really attributes to the retention that I see or that we see um, at our institution. And, you know, if you can remember anything today, any sort of activities that you do to boost morale, to maintain morale, you really need to sustain your efforts. So even after the pandemic is fully over, um, you know, whatever that is, um, you have to sustain these efforts. I think that if you are doing all of these activities and they're really incredible right now, and then just take them away once this is kind of over, um, I think that it comes off as really disingenuous. So you really need to sustain your efforts of moving forward to build on the morale in which you've already built. So uh, next slide. So thank you for your time. And the next speaker is Dr. Katyal. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Sanj Katyal. Uh, you wanna advance the slide, please? And today I'm gonna give you a very quick overview. We're run, running a little bit late. Um, to, and maybe a different perspective to think about burnout from the a viewpoint of positive psychology or what some people call the science of happiness. Next slide. I don't have any disclosures. Next. When we think about physician well-being, we always want to think about a balanced approach, right? It's not enough to make us more mindful or resilient if we're thrown back into a negative work environment every day. And it's important to also know that one side of the equation affects the other side. So tonight we'll talk about personal well-being, but recognize that improving our own well-being makes us more effective when we deal with administration, uh, try to make cultural workflow changes, all the stuff on the organizational side that we all know needs to be done in many of our hospitals. Next slide, please. The HR Commission uh, has done an incredible job kind of getting out in front of all specialties and dealing with burnout and providing resources and uh, testing uh, to improve well-being. Uh, we've also heard a lot of great strategies on, on this topic tonight. But burnout is not the only problem. And more importantly, the absence of burnout does not equal well-being. Here's the problem I really want to tackle, that there are a lot of highly functioning people out there, successful by anyone's standards, that are filled with mild to moderate levels of anxiety, depression, generalized discontent. Right? They spend their lives waiting to get to the next stage in their academic or professional career only to feel a little unfulfilled once they get there. And I was one of those people. I remember really clearly about 10 or 12 years ago driving home wondering why I wasn't happier. It's not that I was unhappy. I had achieved more than I could ever really dream of. I was married to my best friend. We have four healthy kids. I had a really good job designing innovative workflow at a startup company. And I began to really worry that if I couldn't figure out how to find more happiness and more uh, joy when things were this good, how was I ever going to deal with adversity when it would inevitably come, which, by the way, it did. And so I began searching, and I was searching for answers to a single question. How can I learn not just to function, but to actually flourish? And I found answers in positive psychology, organizational leadership, and health neuroscience. Next slide, please. Let's talk really quickly about the word happiness. I, I really don't like to use it much uh, when I give lectures to college students and other things. The, the word that I try to get them to use is flourishing uh, or a state of optimal living over a long period of time. Most people incorrectly think of happiness as a transient emotional state, right? I was happy yesterday, but today I'm sad, or I'll be happy next weekend when I'm not on call. And this isn't what Aristotle meant when he made his famous quote. 
the word that he was using was eudaimonia. And the last bullet on this slide is really important. You know, um, We work hard to get to the next level of our academic career, and we think finally when we're successful, we can relax and then be happy. And I think a lot of us impart this kind of mentality to our kids, uh, but we actually have it backwards. You know, Happy people are more likely to be successful, but the reverse is not always true. And I think we all know successful people who are you know not very happy or often miserable next slide i'm going to skip this but think of traditional psychology as dealing on the left hand of a spectrum of flourishing taking somebody who's functioning at a minus seven or minus eight and getting them to a zero or maybe a plus one if you're lucky positive psychology is just the other end of the spectrum and we really need both areas of focus uh, to really unlock a lot of unrealized potential in all of us. Next slide. So there are a few key principles uh, from positive psychology that are really helpful for physicians. Um, and I wanna try to go over two of them quickly. The first is a model of happiness by Marty Seligman, who was the father of positive psychology. Uh, he described this as a continuum, basically Pleasant life is where we chase money, sex, possessions. A lot of society is stuck in this stage. The good life is where we use our unique strengths to cultivate our character and fully realize our potential. And then we enter the meaningful life when we take this fully realized potential for something other than ourselves, right? Now, the exact terminology doesn't matter, and, and even Seligman has updated this, but the simplicity of the model, I think, can help explain a lot of the discontent that's out there, uh, you know, in, in society. and and in uh, and maybe in, in you know ourselves as well, you know, we keep searching for the new title, the bigger house, the, the nicer car, but don't realize until we work on ourselves and our own potential, we may keep feeling unfulfilled. And and many of us try to you know fill this void by focusing on our kids. You know, we try to replace our discontent with their contentment and achievement, and that doesn't work, right? That's why we have parents you know, screaming at coaches and umpires at sporting events. That's why every parent thinks your kid should be in advanced class. Um, you know, think about the people you know, think about yourself and, and what stage you may be in. Next slide. Okay, the other, the reason that the pleasant life for the, the first stage is so uh, alluring and dangerous is because of another principle that positive psychology has really studied and that's hedonic adaptation which basically states that we get used to everything in our lives that are constant. You know, think about the uh, initial thrill of getting into med school or making partner and their salary and all of that. It was really exciting at first, but now it's just kind of faded into the background. You know, next slide. And, you know, there's an evolutionary reason why things should fade into the background. If they didn't, we wouldn't be able to appreciate or recognize new stimuli or threats from old stimuli that are constant. You know, remember, nature just wanted us to survive long enough to procreate. Didn't care how happy we were along the way. Next slide. This is a graphical representation of hedonic adaptation. And one of the things that I want to talk about is positive psychology does not try to dampen the wave of the, of the positive or, or negative. Uh, but what it tries to do is increase the slope so we know that people are gonna struggle and there's gonna be good times and bad times, but the overall trajectory is what positive psychology attempts to uh, increase. Next slide. Okay, to figure out how to, how to deal with hedonic adaptation and slow it down, let's look at the formula for happiness. We know about half of our happiness comes from our genetic set point. A relatively small amount comes from our circumstances and that's basically because we adapt quickly to them. Uh, now, this is obviously in the absence of extreme uh, poverty or trauma, but that leaves a big chunk, about 40%, that uh, is made up of intentional activities. So in the end, it's not where we live or what we have that makes the difference, it's what we do. Next slide. And what we do uh, has been studied a lot. There's a, a lot of research on happiness boosters, uh, by psychologists. Uh, two of the, the, the main ones are studied. 
and found to be really effective are exercise and religious activity, but there's a whole host of others. And I would encourage you to figure out what your happiness booster is or a couple of them and try to make sure you're getting a consistent uh, dose of them every week. Next slide. Probably the most effective happiness booster is to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Um, you know, the, the key for us to stop taking all the good things in our lives for granted is to learn how to pay attention to them. And the scientific study of gratitude has been heavily um, researched in positive psychology and is probably positive psychology's greatest contribution. Gratitude journaling is found to be really effective. The other piece here is negative visualization, which if you get nothing else from this talk, do negative visualization. Uh, take 30 seconds on your drive home and mentally subtract something good from your life and then think about how things are um, without that. So, you know, tired after a long day of reading cases, imagine if your group imploded and you had to look for another job. Don't feel like driving your daughter to a softball game after, you're, after you come home from work. Fast forward to a time where she's no longer at, living at home and how much you'd give to just spend a car ride with her. Next slide, please. Cultivating attention to things that matter is a big focus of the, of the positive psychology work that I do. Um, and, and when we talk about focus, it's really easy to, uh, and attention, it's really easy to blame distractions and smartphones, especially with our kids. And, and they're certainly a big part of it. Um, but there have always been tempting forms of distractions, although perhaps not as intentionally addictive. But the, the key is really to figure out why we seek distractions in the first place, right? Understand the trigger that's causing me to check my email again after I just checked it five minutes ago, or what's happening inside that's causing me to reach for my phone in the car. Am I bored? Uh, you know, am I afraid of missing something important? Am I, you know, tired of being alone with my thoughts? You know, um, it, all of, all of these uh, things are important to kind of become aware of. You know, when we were younger, time seemed endless, right? We, just checking the time, uh, we, summers used to last forever, years felt like decades, and then as we get older, basically time fast forwards in, in speed, right? The only thing that's changed is our inability to pay attention to time. Right? When we were young, everything was new and captivated our attention. As we got older, we settled into comfortable routines and mental models of life, and each day started to feel the same. You know, uh, so we started looking forward to our weekends, maybe our vacations, maybe retirement. And this uh, look forward only served to speed up time. You know, and this is another example of hedonic adaptation at work. This process causes boredom, a lack of attention in our lives, and poor habits. Next slide, please. So hedonic adaptation causes a lot of us to sleepwalk through much of our lives. You know, we get used to things and we don't really miss them until they're gone. But none of us want to wait till a tragedy strikes before we begin to appreciate how good we had it. You know, how lucky we were to be spending time with our kids. What stroke of good fortune had to have had occurred for us to be able to become physicians. The solution to increasing happiness and uh, fulfillment in our personal and our professional lives is to simply learn to pay attention to things that matter. And gratitude and negative visualization are key pieces of it. But there's another piece that's really important and that's intentionally introducing novelty into our lives. And we can do this by asking questions that anchor us into the present moment. And the present moment is really the only place we ultimately want to be anyway. Um, you know, I, I have two, I have four kids and two of them play baseball competitively. So I played a lot of catch and, you know, it gets old after a while, you know, but when I try to turn it into a game or maybe ask them a little bit different questions to have a different, deeper conversation, I feel myself more present. I feel like I enjoy it more. And I think they do as well. You know, these other things are something, some of the things that I do every day when I read cases, you know, try to relate a study or every fifth study to somebody I know demographically, you know, 
imagine that that paracentesis or that thyroid biopsy, which we all just kind of, you know, blow off, uh, imagine if that's your best friend in there, uh, or imagine if they're scared to death, you know, what can you do to alleviate their suffering? Um, th these are these are the things and questions that matter, and we can learn to focus our attention to them, and I think we will get more fulfillment um, when we do so. And uh, that's it. Thanks for your attention. All right. Outstanding. Um, thank you uh, to five of you for outstanding talks. Uh, very varied in their scope, but uh, similar messages throughout. Um, obviously, we are running a little bit late on time, so I'm just going to uh, try and maybe ask one, maybe two questions, and we'll kind of do this um, for the entire panel. Um, one question that kind of came out over the course of the people asking was, name one thing that brings you joy at work. Collegiality. Okay. Having a patient Having say, a patient they, say they, they trust me. Trust me. It's great. Getting the right diagnosis. Right diagnosis. <laughs> Thank you. We can all relate to that. Connection. Connection. Connection, okay. People I work People with. People I work with. Okay. Um, excellent. So let's ask another question kind of on the flip side. So we talked a little bit about uh, the kind of things that bring you joy in life. How do we help the others around us have joy in their life? One of the questions that came through a couple different times through the audience was, how do you deal with that uh, morale killer at work? The person who kind of brings everybody down. One of the biggest challenges is not just to find joy for ourselves, but to create joy for others. How do we... Uh, help that person along and make their life better, make our life better in turn. Listening to, listening them. to them. Not only I listen really to listen. them, not only listen to them, but try to help them and give them alternatives as to what their frustrations or their, their concerns are. Unmuted. Unmuted. Dr. Margolis, uh, that was one question that also kind of came to you. It talked about the idea of uh, cookies. How do you figure out a way to give that person a cookie? So I, I agree with uh, that. I agree with uh, questions uh, about question. what's going on in their life. But I think everyone wants, you know, the, that pat on the back. You know, I think a job well done goes a long way. Perfect. Well, perhaps, listen, um, perhaps this is a time for mentorship. Time for mentorship. <laughs> well, listen, um, we are at 828. Uh, I want to take a moment and uh, hand the podium back to Dr. Diet, but uh, just want to take a moment to acknowledge all of you for taking the time to teach us about uh, these important concepts um, and for helping us all find joy in our lives. Thank you so much for that time. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, could you advance the slide? Okay, just want to just give you and give you some reminders about CME credit. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I think the thing to know is that you will receive an email and um, that will explain it to you, and you need to get it in by September 11th. And next slide. All right, so I want to wrap things up and share with you links from both our well-being program, the ACR, and um, the RLI. I encourage you to explore these different programs and um, see what you can find. Next, I'd like to thank our ACR staff. They have worked really hard on this and we definitely couldn't have done it without them. Thank you so much. And then our amazing speakers. I'd really like to thank you for sharing your fantastic advice, your examples, and um, just for sharing overall. We really appreciate it. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Gupta and Gupta and Alexa. And last, not least, is I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today. I hope 
what we've been discussing helps you with your well-being journey as you move forward. And I wish you be well and a good evening. Thank you.